Hello everyone and welcome to this event with uh, Professor Neil Ferguson, um, one of those people who really needs no introduction as witnessed by the fact that this is the largest turnout we've ever had for an event we've done um, with CapEx. Um, I'm Robert Colville, uh, Director of the Centre for Policy Studies but also Editor-in-Chief of CapEx and Neil is an incredibly distinguished um, academic and historian. I'm currently based um, at the Hoover Institution in Stanford among um, various other positions, also a board member of the, of the CPS. Um, so um, thanks to him for his continued guidance. But we are here to talk about uh, Zoom, so Doom, um, uh, which is um, uh, the politics of catastrophe, which is um, quite the best value book you will buy. It's um, you twenty five pounds for, for an ex extraordinary length, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary small type, and extraordinary uh, volume of facts and stories. Um, so absolutely, uh, absolutely worth your money. Um, Neil, thank you very, very much for for joining us. Um, we're going to have an opportunity for everyone to ask questions. Please put them in the in the Q and A box um, as we go, or if you're watching um, live on on YouTube um, or uh, Twitter, please um, put them in the comments, and we'll we'll try to get to them. Um, but I wanted to start by reading this book. reminded me of a um, reminded me of, of a trip I took to the States, where I ended up in a in a cinema. I mean, some small I think it was sort of Modesto or somewhere somewhere like that, and. Every trailer for every movie was about the apocalypse. There was a sort of climate apocalypse. There was a monster apocalypse. There was a vampire apocalypse. There was, a, there was, you know, the angels were going to come down to earth. And, oh, I'm, I, what, what is it about this topic that, that, that so fascinates us? What is it that, um, and fascinates you? I mean, why, why I mean, obviously the, the, the pandemic was, was one explanation, but what, what, what is it about, about doom that, that grips us as a, as a species? Oh, Robert, I, I'm delighted that you you called the book Zoom uh, because uh, <laughs> wait, 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 so Zoom was the working title for my, for my own book about speed. So I, that's why it's kind well, of loaded in my head. <laughs> it's but it's appropriate in many ways because I feel as if I've been talking about that Doom on Zoom in my room uh, for uh, a, a very long time. Uh, it's it's obviously a book that has been made relevant by the pandemic, but I had been hatching the idea of a history of disasters for a while and and indeed I'd spent much of 2019 reading apocalyptic science fiction uh, because I, I had this insight that I was I was spending too much time with the past and although history is of vital importance to uh, anybody trying to think seriously about the present and the future History is quite bad at helping you think about major technological discontinuities. And science fiction is great at that because, you know, in science fiction, uh, you, you've got uh, nine out of the next five technological breakthroughs, uh, including obviously flying cars. So I was reading my way through books about disaster uh, and having the same feeling that you had in that cinema, that we really are fascinated by doom in the largest sense of the end of the world, uh, the end of the species, the destruction of, of the planet. It is, uh, it is certainly box office has been through most of my life. Disaster movies have, have uh, been popular for, for decades. And, and I think that the simple answer to your question is that hardwired into us uh, is some sense uh, that it could all go up in smoke. It, it must be uh, uh, the product of uh, evolution because it seems to manifest itself very early on when humans began to record their culture. Uh, there are ap apocalyptic denouements in most of the great religions. And I would guess, and it's just a guess because this is the realm of prehistory, that uh, many people in the distant past had the same response that, that we have when we're involved in a disaster, even if it's a relatively small scale one. If, if you're in the midst of a wildfire, like some of the characters I quote in Doom uh, out in the American Midwest 100 years ago, if it's, if it's a big wildfire, it can, it can feel like the end of the world to you, even although it's just a, a pretty big wildfire. So we clearly are inclined to generalize from relatively small sized disasters uh, to something much, much larger. And this appeals to us psychologically. And in fact, thinking about the end of the world is more interesting than thinking about a medium sized disaster. Uh, and that's why predictions of the end of the world have been coming thick and, and fast really throughout recorded history. And only a couple of years ago, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said the world would end in, in 12 years if we didn't 
address the problem of climate change. That resonates not because of, there's a powerful body of scientific evidence that the world is going to end in, in what would now be 10 years. It resonates because we're very, very interested in the idea of the end of the world. Yes, I mean, you, you, you sort of start the book with, um, with you know, the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, which, which is a kind of moment of apocalypse. And then there's, um, you know, then you go up to Elon Musk predicting that either we merge with AI or we, um, or we, uh, or, or we go extinct within 20 years. So he's, he's, a, he's a bit more optimistic than, than AOC, <laughs> but, but not, not much. It's still coming on our watch. That's the dispiriting thing. But, but in reality... Uh, if one, you know, reads uh, closely what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying about uh, its worst case scenario, it's it's actually not the end of the world uh, that's being predicted here, but very, very significant disruptions due to rising temperatures. And uh, and this will proceed at a slow enough pace that, that human beings will will relocate. So we, we're looking forward not to the end of the world, but but certainly to a great deal of disruption, discontinuity and, and, and mass migration very likely. So at any event, I think what's fascinating to me is that that we spend so much time visualizing uh, the end of the world or, or reading books about catastrophic plagues that leave just one person alive or in, in Margaret Atwood's uh, Oryx and Crake trilogy, just a handful of, of people plus some genetically engineered uh, mutants. Um, that, that's it. And we're fascinated by this it makes us much less well equipped to think about a disaster which kills 0.05% of the world's population, which is the current score of, for COVID-19. Uh, I mean, the difference between uh, nearly everybody and 0.05% of humanity is a pretty huge one, but our brains are not very good at coping with that. So, so we, we, we think of the COVID-19 disaster as a very, very big one. Um, not the end of the world, but something really kind of up there. But, but in truth in historical perspective it, it's not a it's not really a, a top 20 disaster and, and, and you imagine sort of back in the 60s for example we, when, when we've had previous pandemics that did you know everyone felt you know blimey this is this is it i mean that so that, that's one of the kind of myths you bust as it were one, one of the others is is, is and I'm, I'm interested in whether you've revised this view um given the in the month that came out since the book one of the others is that you know is that we tend to ascribe disasters to sort of wicked emperors basically that um, you know that if only it had been biden or obama in the white house rather than trump then things would have been different if only it had been you know if only it hadn't been Boris in, in in number 10 you know or matt hancock in in the fh however you want to do it but what you you have this phrase like the fractal the fractal geometry of, of disaster that that you know the what, what tends to happen is sort of systems fall over and they fall over in ways that people couldn't really have expected Yes, I, I got quite interested in this uh, through an unexpected uh, connection. I was thinking an, aloud about a, a history of disaster. And one of my colleagues at the Hoover Institution, uh, Manny Rincon Cruz, uh, said, you really should read Richard Feynman's account of the Space Shuttle Challenger disaster. And I hadn't really intended to write about that because, in fact, it's a very small disaster even if it's a spectacular one, because the only people who, who, who died were the seven crew members. And my intention had been to focus on large disasters in which really significant numbers of people died. But when I read Feynman's account of the Challenger disaster, which is a, a must read, I, I realized that I actually had to write about some smaller scale disasters because of this fractal geometry phenomenon that, that all disasters are a bit like Tolstoy's happy families are all alike, just, just sort of regardless of, of the scale and even a pile up on the motorway has something of this, of this quality. At any went, uh, uh, event, what Feynman showed was that although the Washington press corps immediate response to the space shuttle blowing up was to blame it on Ronald Reagan, who was then president, uh, the, the argument, by the way, in case you're interested, was that Reagan had wanted to mention the launch in the State of the Union address. So the launch had been rushed and therefore the thing had blown up. There was nothing to this story, it turned out, nothing at all. And what had really happened, Feynman discovered, he, by the way, was this quirky but brilliant physicist from Caltech who absolutely ignored the rules of the road of a Washington uh, inquiry. Feynman discovered that the engineers at NASA had known all along there was a one in a hundred chance the thing would blow up, which, which meant it was going to blow up at some point. They were clearly going to do that many launches. And uh, it, this had been turned by 
an enigmatic official with whom they could never get meetings, a bureaucrat, mid-level bureaucrat at NASA, into one in 100,000. Now, the difference between one in 100 and one in 100,000 is pretty significant if you're trying to decide whether to launch a rocket. Uh, and I realized that Mr. Kingsbury, this is the figure that they can never get a meeting with, is, is a sort of universal figure, uh, this mid-level figure who uh, ultimately is more, much more important in the disaster than the president. I think in the case of COVID-19, the overwhelming impulse for liberal um, and left-wing journalists last year was to blame the populists at the top. It was just too easy a target for them to hit, not least because in their various ways, uh, Donald Trump, Boris Johnson, Jair Bolsonaro did make mistakes and say things that, that turned out to be foolish. Uh, and so it was really easy to write any number of pieces saying it's all the fault of these uh, populist uh, buffoons at the top. The reality was quite different. Uh, and you can see that in three ways, I think. First, there were plenty of countries without populist leaders that did just as bad as the United States, just as badly as the United States uh, and the UK. Uh, um, secondly, the counterfactual is just not plausible, that if Biden had been president a year early, there wouldn't have been half a million deaths. I mean, even Ron Klain, who's Biden's chief of staff, acknowledged in 2019 that if swine flu had been as dead deadly a virus uh, in 2009 as COVID turned out to be, as SARS-CoV-2 turned out to be, then there would have been as big a disaster under Obama. But the third thing that's really important to grasp, and we must learn this, this is really why I wrote the book, is that what went wrong was not really a failure at the top. Yes, um, the populist leaders made mistakes, but what went wrong happened at the mid-level, at the Mr. Kingsbury level. For example, Centers for Disease Control, the CDC in the US, totally and utterly screwed up testing. Not only preventing other people producing tests, but then producing a test that didn't work. Um, second uh, example, no even half-assed attempt at contact tracing uh, in the US, despite the biggest technology companies being based there. Third example, practically everyone in the West leaves the elderly exposed in elderly care homes. It's got nothing to do with politics. Uh, it's a failure that happens at regional or local levels. And then finally, nobody enforces quarantines. I mean, nobody. There's no serious enforcement of quarantines, certainly last year in most Western countries. And none of that has anything to do with decisions taken at the very top level. So I, I got a bit irritated by Jim Fowler's uh, article in The Atlantic in which he said, it's all the fault of Trump because it's pilot error. Uh, because being the president of the United States is like flying a light aircraft. And, and if the thing crashes, it's the pilot's fault. I mean, if you think being the president of the United States is like flying a light aircraft, Jim, you need to retire from journalism because it's nothing like that. It's just nothing like that. And the same goes for being prime minister. Actually, I think we've had a very, very good glimpse of what it was really like from Dominic Cummings's testimony. Well, I was going to ask, yeah. 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 I mean, that's a tremendously valuable, from a historian's vantage point, insight into what it was really like in, in uh, Whitehall and Westminster last year. And, and, and even that got misrepresented in the press because it turned into Dom Cummings blames his boss Boris for screwing up COVID. But that wasn't at all what he was saying. What he was saying was that there was, it was a system wide It was part of what he was saying. Think, well, it was, it was not the most important part of what he was saying, to my mind. Uh, and, and it certainly wasn't as if he was saying, if only Theresa May had still been prime minister, this would all have been fine, much less uh, Jeremy Corbyn. So the counterfactuals don't work. Uh, uh, and, and that seems to me to be a clue as to what really went wrong. It wasn't a failure at the top, even if mistakes were made at the top. They weren't the crucial mistakes that killed a lot of people. So um, in, in terms of the book, um, you obviously, as, as I said, you, you, it, 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 it's kind of encyclopedic in scope. What, this is a sort of slightly odd question, but what's what, not your favourite disaster? Because, I mean, one, one of the charges, actually, some of you have said is you, you seem to take entirely too much joy in depicting these kind of these terrible events, which we, but what's, what's the thing that, what's the, what's the thing that most interests you that our readers will have absolutely no idea about? Um, the kind of like for me like it's always like things like the Taiping Rebellion where you know millions of people died and absolutely no one in the West has any clue. <laughs> millions of people died because because a Chinese guy decided he was the son of Jesus and no one yeah. or, the, or the younger brother of Jesus and no one has has actually heard of that. 
Um, so what, what's, what's the thing in the book that, that, that if you could, or the, like the, the two or three things that you, if you could just pull out and dangle in front of people as an enticement to get them to buy it, perhaps? Well, I, I think it's, it's right to say that it's encyclopedic. I really wanted to feel that if you'd heard of a disaster, it would be in there and, and you'd learn something more about it. So, I mean, if you think you know about the Titanic or Chernobyl, you, you need to read Doom because I'll tell you what really happened. Uh, and it's not what you get from the movie or the, the television dramatization. But you're, you're right uh, that not every reviewer uh, shares my gallows humor. Um, perhaps growing up in Glasgow just gives you a a warped sense of, of the kind of comical. The value aspect. of human life. Perhaps also the value of human life is, is somewhat uh, held at somewhat lower price in Glasgow than it is in, in, uh, in the Upper East Side of Manhattan or, or in Los Angeles. But, but actually, um, as I try to show, people who've really confronted disaster often do cope with it through uh, black humor, gallows humor, and that that's actually part of what's interesting. Uh, when when you're singing as a, as they sang on the Western Front, the bells of hell go tingling a ling for you, but not for me. You're laughing in the face of death because your probability of death, if you're in the infantry on the Western Front in 1916, is is actually pretty high. Uh, and and I I thought I thought it was important to capture that. And and, and then in a way. It's not just Glasgow, it's Britain has had a tradition of mocking or making light of death that is quite foreign to the United States, where you're not even allowed to use the word die. People pass uh, in the United States. And Evelyn Waugh made fun of this uh, inability of Americans to kind of confront death, uh, even to talk about it, much less to laugh about it. So it's an important part of Doom to talk about the, the comic quality of catastrophe. But you asked what are the kind of forgotten or less well-known disasters? And I think you were right to mention Taiping because what's really interesting to me is that disasters in Asia are just bigger. And that's partly because of very large concentrations of population for long periods of time. But it's also because in fact, that there are features of Asia uh, geological features that just make it more dangerous. I mean, Japan is just a way more dangerous place to construct an island civilization than, than the British Isles, because it's incredibly vulnerable to, to earthquakes and tsunamis by the standards of, of Western Europe. I enjoyed, I enjoyed the wrong word, I found it fascinating to write about Asian disasters because it taught me an important thing. They're always really much bigger uh, uh, often it's sort of two orders of magnitude bigger in terms of the death tolls. Uh, who now on this call has heard of the Banqiao Dam disaster? Uh, but but the, the Maoist regime was very, very keen on dams. Uh, Mao even wrote a poem about them. It's just that the dams they built were really crappy. Uh, and, and, and indeed, there was a fundamental problem with a lot of early People's Republic of China engineering, that it was it was really poor. And that meant that things would just collapse with disastrous consequences. And Ban Chao was one of the biggest disasters in the history of the PRC. Uh, I found myself on the edge of my desk chair wondering if the Three Gorges Dam was going to go last year because it got very close to uh, to a tipping point. So I think what, what I took I away from- I'm actually looking that up because um, we kind of couldn't find it, but you, 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 give a, you, you give an estimate of the death toll if that, if that goes, which is a, a stop at your eye popping. And it, it's amazing how dangerous the situation became last summer. It would be absolutely devastating for the PRC if, if the Three Gorges Dam uh, went critical because of, uh, of the flooding of all the major cities downstream of it. Anyway, this actually happened in the case of the Banqiao Dam. And I think what I took away from writing that part of the book was that although we tend to remember Western disasters, uh, Americans have their great floods that they, they recollect or great wildfires, they're much smaller than the equivalent events in Asia in terms of loss of, of life. Uh, and that's important when you start talking about climate change, leave aside earthquakes, uh, because it's quite probable in my mind that the disasters that will arise uh, globally uh, from the worst case scenario, if that is indeed what happens, will be much, much more destructive 
uh, in the East than in than the West, and certainly than in, in North America. And this is important because if you're concerned about the disasters that might arise from climate change, it's a not insignificant fact that half of all the increase in CO2 emissions since the Paris climate meeting or since Greta Thunberg was born actually are accounted for by by China. That this is this is a whirlwind that they will reap at some point. Yes, although I mean, I mean, Bangladesh is a sort of classic case study, isn't it? That um, that you know, the, the 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 best way out is growth. That if you you know the it, it, you know, the, the the hurricanes and typhoons and are just as severe now, but the death toll is so much lower because they because of rising prosperity. That's that's right, and I mean Bjorn Lomborg's book on this, I thought was good on the, the the realities of the challenge. It's not that it doesn't exist as a problem, but the the solutions have to be related to economic growth. If you adopt solutions that actually slow or halt growth, uh, it's going to be self-defeating. Climate's not a big part of this of this book, partly because it already occupies too much airtime relative to the other conceivable disasters that we have to grapple with in the near term. And that, that seemed to me one of the problems that got us into the COVID mess, that we were having endless conferences, including the World Economic Forum in January last year on climate change, even when a pandemic had begun and was rapidly bearing down on us. So, I mean, you, 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 in the book, you, you, you lay, state your claim to prescience of having sort of seen, it, seen this coming. My, my, my claim is that, yes, I, I, I worked as a, when I was in my freelance days um, on, the, on the launch of the, um, uh, the CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, and, and on, on you know, Larry Summers wrote an op-ed I think with the Wall Street Journal saying that we are devoting a tiny fraction of our GDP to something which is mathematically almost certain to uh, to cost us a very great deal more more money, and of course no one apart from a, a few paid attention. But I, I, I wanted to ask you the, the question, which which obviously you will get you will get asked by everyone, which is um, what are the disasters you see that are most like you, you see most likely or that, that you're most concerned about? I mean, a, a big chunk of this book, as as with kind of quite a lot of your thinking, I think, is, is taken up by America versus versus China. Um, and the potential for that to, to spiral out of control. Well, one of the key points the book makes is that the distinction between natural and man-made disasters is a false dichotomy. Now, that's an idea I kind of borrowed and adapted from Amartya Sen, who made that point about famines many years ago. Uh, but I actually think it's generally true, and that's why the subtitle of the book is The Politics of Catastrophe. It, it takes human agency, human decision-making, uh, if not necessarily politics, to turn a new pathogen into half a million dead in one country and next to none in, in another. Uh, and so I, I wanted to kind of explore the theme that, that all disasters are at some level consequences of human agency, even if it's the decision to build a city next to a volcano. Yeah, the volcano is a good or, 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 or to go out and kind of have your wet markets near, yeah. The, yeah. Uh, exactly. Or, or, for that matter, to conduct uh, gain-of-function experiments with coronaviruses in a laboratory. Uh, if that's where this originated, and we still don't know for sure, then it sure as hell was a man-made uh, disaster. But, but that leads, I think, to the important insight that historically the biggest forms of disaster are A, pandemics, B, wars. And we are certainly attaching too low a probability to a US-China war at the moment. It's very few people, I think, fully uh, grasp the scale of such a conflict if it were to break out, because we've got used to small wars. I mean, let's face it, they dragged on a long time, but Iraq and Afghanistan were really quite small, one might even say colonial policing operations by the standards of, of superpower wars. If the US and China went to war over Taiwan, it would be an enormously disruptive event, uh, especially if you buy Jim Stavridis's argument that it would end up going going nuclear. I, I think that's a very big disaster that could happen in a much shorter time frame uh, than anything associated with climate change. And I'll add a kind of supplementary point that such a war would be very different from past wars because it would have a large cyber element. And if there's one disaster I suspect we're really poorly prepared for, it's a major cyber attack that, that takes out the, the critical infrastructure for a lengthy period of time. If a bunch of East European crooks can disable the biggest pipeline on the East Coast of the US for days with some ransomware, 
just think what the Chinese and the Russians together could do. So I think that seems like a near term and a novel form of disaster. We are highly reliant on this thing, the internet, that you and I are using to have this conversation. Uh, if it were out, I'm not sure how we'd cope at all. And I don't know of many organizations, certainly none that I'm involved in, that, that have a contingency plan for a total outage. What exactly is the plan if the cell phones stop working and, and the internet uh, is just a revolving beach ball of death. So I, I think that's a really important and, and near-term challenge we face. But of course, the, there are a great many others. I, I provide an extensive list of nightmare scenarios for those who, who are sleeping too well, uh, but I won't, I won't exhaust you by listing them all on this call. But, but, but that speaks to it. I mean, uh, we'll, we'll move on to audience questions because, because they're coming in thick and fast and please ask, ask some more. Um, uh, but that, that speaks to another one of the points you make about um, like we 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 fix you know we fixated um, thanks to Taleb's book on on black swans this idea that things things come out of nowhere and actually what you say is that these are more from sort of grey rhinos they are things that everyone kind of sees lumbering towards them but doesn't pay that much attention to like pandemics were top of the global the UK's risk register you know, the, you know lots of people were having very you know detailed conferences about pandemics the financial crisis there were people who saw it you know who who went hang on a second maybe all this stuff we're doing with derivatives isn't isn't the best idea um, and like what you saying you know cyber and um you know cyber and, and, and taiwan those those are not sort of understudied areas but it's just when you're trying to you know fix the nhs and win elections and all the other stuff that governments try to do you know day in day out it's quite hard to raise your gaze to, to them it's my my book is a strange menagerie uh, there are the gray rhinos that that come slowly trundling towards you across the Serengeti, the black swans that seem to come completely out of left field. And then I, I add for good measure the dragon kings. These are the events that are sort of so colossal in their consequences that their historical significance is much greater than the, the body count. I think the problem with gray rhinos is a, a problem of, of over prediction. I mean, there are too many Cassandras out there and there's too big a market for uh, prophecies of, of doom. Uh, and you can make a good living by predicting a financial crisis every year. I mean, sooner or later, you'll get one. Uh, so you just keep on predicting and bang, you're Dr. Doom with a, a regular gig on the on the lecture circuit. I think the rest of us uh, tune out after a certain point. As I showed, there were any number of predictions of a pandemic. Uh, and some of them famous TED Talks by Bill Gates and the like. But, but as there was a kind of prediction a year for 20 years, uh, I think people became somewhat desensitized, just as after a certain point, I don't think we really did worry about uh, World War Three and the, the dropping of, uh, of, of nuclear uh, missiles. Uh, I, I, I think that's part of the difficulty. But I, I also sense that we have uh, a very significant structural problem, which is one of the big takeaways of the book for me. And that is that we give ourselves the illusion of preparedness. And this is the thing that the COVID has revealed very clearly, that on paper, the United States and the United Kingdom were the best prepared countries for such a public health emergency. They came out in first and second place in the Economist Intelligence Unit's 2019 survey. And yet both countries did really pretty badly, not catastrophically badly, not Peru badly, but a lot worse than a good many uh, peers. And, and the key here is that we had the illusion of preparedness. And this is where I think the point of failure gets really interesting. Why was it that uh, the civil servants and the scientific advisors and the people who drew up the preparedness plans thought we were okay? Or did they secretly know that we wouldn't be? Uh, and, and I think that's a really interesting point. In the case of the United States, the guy whose job it was, who was Assistant Secretary for Preparedness, Robert Cadleck, he kind of knew that the plans wouldn't work and, and more or less admitted as much in an obscure lecture that Philip Zellico directed me towards uh, from 2018, where he said if there actually were a pandemic, we'd be SOL, which is, uh, I'm afraid to say, short for shit out of luck. So the guy whose one job it was sort of kind of knew that there was a there was a problem. I think we have this illusion of preparedness. So we see the grey rhino, we watch the TED talk, then there's a meeting, the committee meets, another committee meets, at least one report is drawn up and there's probably a PowerPoint presentation that goes with it. Um, and the, the report's lengthy and it, it sort of covers a lot of asses and ticks a lot of boxes. And that's the process complete. 
uh, and you can report that you're ready for a pandemic. But has anybody actually done a drill? Has there been any simulation? Has there been any serious attempt to see uh, if the scenario were a bit different, how it would go? We, I, mean, I think that's the crux. Famously, the UK did Operation Cygnus, and then um, uh, it said it's all going to be a disaster, and everyone went, oh, well. Yes, and same time again next week, chaps, or, you know, and, and now let's all catch the, the 515 train home. I think that's that's really important that in many Western uh, democracies, there is a bureaucratic way of doing preparedness, which is, in fact, the wrong way to do it. And often these same agencies, when when a disaster begins, they'll say, well, we, we, we need to wait for more data before we can really decide. And that um, ma mantra of data dependence, which actually comes out of the realm of monetary policy and economics, is, is a council of, of uh, procrastination. Uh, and Henry Kissinger came up with a brilliant formulation uh, for this way back in the 60s. He called it the problem of conjecture. And the argument he made then, and I think it's very applicable now, is that if you're in particularly a democratic government, the temptation is always to kick the can down the road because taking action now early in the crisis, as we would have had to do in, let's say, the second or third week of January, would have had a cost. It would have seemed to most commentators, certainly in the newspapers, as an overreaction to something that was no worse than the seasonal flu. You can imagine the pieces. Uh, and and that's, that's costly. And what, what's the payoff? Suppose you get it right. And you successfully preempt the disaster. As Kissinger says, in nine times out of 10, there'll be no gratitude. Nobody will say, well done for avoiding that disaster if it doesn't happen. So I think that the incentives for democratic politicians encourage them at least to rely on bureaucratic advice. Uh, and that is usually to wait for more data. And in the case of a pandemic, that's the one thing you shouldn't do. You need to actually take early action, as Larry Brilliant has been arguing for many years. And on a smaller scale, you know, we've, we've spent a decade studying the options for social care, which haven't changed, um, but it just, you know, it's always easier to, to put it up. Um, some, some really good questions, and I'm going to try to get to, to as many as I, I can. Um, um, Howard Simpson, who says, hello from Glasgow, and he shares your gallows humour, um, says that COVID seems to be the first pandemic of the social media age. Um, you know, it does it does that make it harder to, to, to tackle these things? And um, just to try and bundle, bundle um, people together, um, uh, James, James Horak says, um, is there any suggestion that Western culture is more susceptible to disaster uh, doom scenarios or less good at, at, at coping with them uh, versus others? Two great questions, thanks very much. Uh, I, I write at some length in, in Doom about the way social media uh, made life more difficult, uh, not least because of uh, the pre-existing networks of conspiracy theorists who, who went to town early on uh, with uh, gratuitously misleading uh, misinformation and disinformation about the virus itself, about potential therapies and about vaccines. And if there's one thing that's going to cause another wave to occur in the United States that probably will kill people, it's anti-vax uh, as an online phenomenon. It was there before. It has go gone from strength to strength uh, in the context of COVID. Now, of course, it's not new that fake news should spread during a, a crisis. Daniel Defoe writes about it uh, in his uh, account of the 1665 plague year in London, lots of mad pamphlets were circulating then, and, and indeed in almost every plague, you find these uh, uh, very non-scientific, uh, often religious or pseudo-religious explanations of what's going on. But I, but I think it's, it's very, very difficult to manage uh, any public information uh, strategy if there is a, a host of competing voices being amplified by Facebook groups, uh, arguing that you're part of the conspiracy. I mean, that's not to say the public health messaging was good. It was often terrible in the West, uh, but I don't think it was uh, it was made any easier to be uh, to be uh, competing with with the Facebook groups that were spreading the disinformation. Now, the interesting question about uh, that your second question were asked: uh, How far is is the West uh, better or worse at this than I suppose the East? Is that I think in in some ways. There was a wrong analysis last year, which now looks wrong, but only only recently. The wrong analysis last year was, oh, these individualistic uh, uh, Westerners just can't do a, an anti-pandemic strategy the way the marvelous Chinese can do with their 
their terrific levels of of state control and and their culture of of collectivism. I thought that was nonsense at the time, but I think it's very obviously nonsense now uh, for a couple of reasons. First, it turns out that having a kind of competitive free market economic system gets you vaccines that work as opposed to ones that don't. And and that's going to be a pretty significant uh, difference uh, in the coming months where countries that use the Western vaccines, including, I want to emphasize the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, but certainly the mRNA vaccines are just going to do far better than those that relied on the Chinese vaccines because their efficacy seems to be very low indeed. Let let, let alone Sputnik, the... uh... The, the knockoff Starbucks of the uh, of the vaccine world. Yes, although I think if I had a choice between Russian and Chinese, I'd probably choose the Russian if uh, if those were my if those were my only options. Uh, but the other point that's really important, uh, particularly for for capex, is that in truth we we didn't really behave as the cultural stereotyping would imply. Uh, Sure, I heard lots of people say on both sides of the Atlantic, oh, we're far too liberty loving to have a contact tracing app on our phones. But these same same people appeared to think it okay to be confined to our homes for weeks on end uh, under lockdowns, whereas the countries that made good use of technology, uh, Taiwan and South Korea, avoided, at least until very recently, strict lockdowns. We actually ended up sacrificing liberty far more in the West with the policies we adopted. And I personally would rather have had a Taiwanese style or South Korean style contact tracing app than a lockdown if that choice had been uh, available. So I, I think what's what seems to me crucial here is that, that generalizations about culture are not that helpful. What really matters is, for example, how you use the technology. Uh, now, social media has have certainly not been helpful, but the Taiwanese and South Koreans showed that you could use technology in ways that really were very helpful without compromising individual liberty in the way that uh, people worried about in, in the West. So I'm much more interested as an historian in the relatively short run changes in behavior that you can bring about through ideas, institutions and incentives than in claims that long-lasting cultures really uh, have a big impact on on how a society handles a pandemic. That that seems to me to change a lot over time. Last thought, the same country, the United States, handles the 1957-58 Asian flu completely differently from the United States of 2020. Uh, Same place. uh, People related a couple of generations apart but a completely and utterly different cultural response i think people often forget how quickly these cultures in fact change over time so again bundling some some questions together because we've got so many good ones um so mark um Althwaite asks um given the recent theories on um the lab leak theory um peter daschak um etc do you think the global elites and their bureaucracies are capable of learning any of the right lessons and there's a similar I mean, Alexander Burley just asked what's the most important lesson to learn from the pandemic. And then, um, <coughs> sorry, Richard Hamilton um, picks up on your point about middle management. Is that something that's always been with us or, or is there a way we can to mitigate the risks? In other words, in other, like, what can we do differently and better, both at a global, both as, you know, as, a, as a global, um, you know, on a global level and in terms of the, kind of rewiring our, um, our, um, our governments? Um, great questions. Mark, I think uh, you're, you're right that something very fishy went on in the way that the lab leak hypothesis was uh, smothered almost fatally uh, by a, a rather dodgy uh, a combination of editors of academic publications, uh, scientists and public health officials, and uh, the network platforms, uh, which probably played the most uh, malignant role by effectively censoring people who wanted to promote the hypothesis that there had been a a lab leak. What does this tell us? I think it tells us that those who talk about the science fail to understand how science actually works and what science is. Science is a very uh, decentralized endeavor to arrive at Uh, or get close to to truth by falsifying uh, hypotheses. Uh, That's really the the essence of the enterprise. Uh, And it it depends on certain things working properly. Uh, 
peer review is one. Uh, and the truth is that the peer review is is fraught with problems. Publication is another one. It too is uh, fraught with problems, particularly if a relatively small number of editors and a relatively small number of journals control the flow to publication. And so for me, the good thing is that this entire crisis has shone a bright light on how science actually works, which we as, as non-scientists, and I, I'm the black sheep of my family, everybody else is a scientist except me, us, us lay people can see, ah, it's great that there are these armies of researchers in multiple disciplines trying to arrive at answers to questions like, how does this spread and how can we vaccinate against it? Uh, but it's also troubling that this process is, is gameable uh, and that we have moved, I think, in the last decade or so into a world in which it is possible to suppress good research, uh, even to unpublish it in some cases, as an increasingly uh, powerful set of institutions, including the network platforms, can pursue politically motivated censorship and claim that they're doing it in the name of science. So my belief is in the scientific method as it evolved in the scientific revolution. It, it is not going to serve us if it does not remain meaningfully competitive. That is to say, all hypotheses have to be up there, out there, and ready to be tested. It has to be competitive, and it also needs to be transparent so that we, we find out uh, and I'm glad to say we have found out uh, when the likes of Peter Daszak are trying to are trying to game uh, game the system because of conflicts of interest. Ultimately, science is not free. You can't do it on the cheap. And and that fact of large scale flows of funding, including from governments, including uh, the Chinese government, has created meaningful conflicts of interest. Those need to be fully transparent to the public gaze. That's, that's not just about science. That's also about the global global bureaucracies. China has invested very heavily in in uh, in the WHO in its presence in these multinational organisations. That's absolutely right. And this is another coming to the second point uh, takeaway of the the pandemic that the Chinese got very well inserted into multiple uh, international agencies, including standard setting agencies like the World Telecommunication Union. And that means that those uh, bodies, and it's not only the, the World Health Organization, are no longer doing their job as, as they should be. Uh, so that seems to me is something that Matt Pottinger talked about when he was at the National Security Council under Trump. We mustn't lose sight of that. It's enormously important. Final point on middle management. I think that Western governments need to take a long, hard look at what it was that made the Taiwanese response so much nimbler, uh, and the South Korean too, and ask why we were so much more sluggish by comparison, why our public health agencies dithered around in January and February and into March and then hit the panic button when the other Neil Ferguson, not me, but the NEIL Ferguson published his apocalyptic paper on March the, 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 the bad Neil Ferguson. The, well, I'm not going to say that because I, I don't, um, I don't uh, doubt that Neil Ferguson has made significant contributions to epidemiological modelling. I won't comment on his private life because that's his private life. Uh, but I, I'll, I'll put it this way. It was a very, very bad sequence of events that led to his paper triggering an extremely late and I thought somewhat panicky response that, that produced lockdowns, the net benefits of which I think will still be, will still be a matter for debate for, for years to come. So something went much better in Taiwan. And I don't think we paid nearly enough attention to it because the other Neil Ferguson said, we need to learn from China, i.e. we need to copy the lockdown strategy that they used in China. He admitted this in a recent interview in the Times, that that was the model. And he even said, we weren't sure we could do it in a non-communist country, and it turned out we could. But what we should have been doing was copying the Taiwanese response, i.e. the Republic of China's response, because that response was designed to use technology as well as uh, testing, uh, use websites to cope with the pandemic preemptively and in a way that avoided the need for lockdowns. So one of the heroes of the book is Audrey Tang, the Taiwanese digital minister, who's pioneered this style of using technology to make government more accountable to citizens. And I'm a big fan of that. I think we need to be sending civil servants to Taipei to learn from Audrey Tang and, and see ways in which we could make government 
nimbler, leaner as well, but above all, more responsive to citizens. And, and that, I think, is a more fruitful avenue of approach than drain the swamp. Because in the end, we all felt the frustrations with the administrative state that produced Trump and Brexit. I mean, everybody who really thinks about it for any length of time knows that there are meaningful dysfunctional features of the way that modern bureaucratic governments function. I, I wrote about this in a book called The Great Degeneration 10 years ago. But populism in the drain the swamp mode has not been the solution. It tried to be, but it actually lacked the sophistication to solve these problems. I think they're solvable and we mustn't lose the energy that lay behind those 2016 revolts. But we need to try, I think, to approach the problem with a, a rapier rather than a sledgehammer. I'm changing tack slightly. Another lovely question from Lewis Brown. Um, the, in addition to our, um, our, our fascination with doom and, and catastrophe, we've also had a, a fascination with idyllic, almost mythical states of nature. Um, do, do you think our fascination with apocalypse relates to our fascination with, with sort of lost utopia? Maybe this could be your next book. <laughs> yes, that makes me think of, of Cole's, uh, Thomas Cole's great cycle of empire that you can go and see in the New York uh, Historical Society's museum. Yeah, you, you start in the state of nature uh, and then you, you get, get agricultural and then you get commercial and then you get imperial. And then along comes the apocalypse and you're reduced uh, back to a state of nature, albeit with ruins. Uh, rather than purely uh, uh, pastoral sylvan uh, groves. I, I think you're right. I think part of what is exciting about uh, Apocalypse, whether it's in, uh, in the Book of Revelation or in a science fiction movie, is this sense of sweeping away all the clutter of, of modernity. Uh, and of course, in a lot of these uh, science fiction versions, that there is a noble savage who's who's sort of fighting it out uh, in the in the post-apocalyptic, stripped down Mad Max landscape. Yeah, I'm sure that's part of the appeal. Well, you have the brave new world scenario of you know, the savage versus the, the civilized world. Exactly, and the savage is, is the tragic hero of, of, of brave new world. Um, so another changing tack again. Um, another quick question from uh, Anne Van Pal. Um, uh, the, the consequences of catastrophic events Versus versus probability. Given the, the sort of fiscal constraints, what what? And he, he apologizes. He hasn't read the book, so um, he may address this. But what are the um, analytical uh, techniques or framework would you recommend for resource allocation for low likelihood high consequence events? I mean, how much of the government's budget and attention should be devoted to uh, to to your rhinos and swans and, and dragon kings? Well, it, it's the right question uh, because, of course, you, you could uh, bankrupt yourself by having. Uh, too many contingency plans uh, and, and, and paying, uh, as it were, too much insurance relative to your risk. The I difficulty is that- On a lower level, you know, we, we've run the NHS in the UK on a, basically a sort of, like a kind of Toyota delivery line. It's been, um, you know, uh, in the same way we run our trains, that um, it's, you know, you keep service capacity low, push, push people through, um, but then you're more, more vulnerable, vulnerable to, to, to shocks. I mean, it's a sort of classic example Right. And, and actually, if one looks back on the 1950s, when the big influenza pandemics were still an issue, uh, there was a great deal more hospital capacity uh, relative to population on both sides of the Atlantic. I mean, the US had far more spare beds in 57, 58. It was one reason they were able to say, just uh, let it let it rip, which effectively was the Eisenhower strategy. I hadn't fully realized until I delved into the, 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 the numbers that, that, in fact, they'd had much more hospital capacity then and therefore weren't facing the, the risk of swamping the system. So I think the key mistake that some people make is to believe that there should be a Cassandra in every department. Uh, th this was an argument uh, that RP Eddy uh, made a, a few years ago in a book about the Cassandra syndrome. I actually think Cassandras are a problem because they, they over predict disaster and uh, this in fact induces a certain paralysis or fatalism, you can't predict disasters because they lie in the realm of uncertainty and you can't actually attach probabilities to them. That, that's the maddening thing to someone like the questioner who perhaps has a risk management background. The, the really annoying thing is that th these are not calculable risks. They're in, in the realm of Frank Knight's uh, or Keynes's uncertainty and there just aren't probabilities. So what's the, what's the right response? I think you need to emphasize general paranoia and rapidity of response 
over meticulous preparation for the wrong disaster. I think the bureaucratic mindset says everything is bad. We must have a plan for every contingency, whether it's 0.01% probability or, or 1% probability. Let's just have a contingency plan. And then when disaster happens, we can say, hey, at least we had a plan. Uh, i.e. we've the, covered um, our assets. The, the, the mass coronal ejection task force to deal with um, a, 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 a solar wave which wipes out all the satellites. I, I think that you need to have considered this scenario, but the most important thing is not to have a 36-page preparedness plan for every scenario signed off on by a bunch of bureaucrats. The, the thing is to be quick on the draw. Uh, and that that's the conclusion the book comes to that what gave Taiwan an edge was the speed of response. Same with South Korea. Uh, it's not that they'd spent a lot more on planning or on preparedness. They didn't have more masks than we had. They had a shortage in Taiwan of masks at the beginning. They didn't have any tests. Nobody had tests to begin with, but they got testing kits made far faster. So it's not the prediction business that you want to be in because you're not going to predict the next black swan. You're not going to know exactly when the next pandemic comes or the next earthquake in California. But you need to test your system for speed of response because that seems to me the critical thing. Um, and that, that that's why I recommend general paranoia and, and being quick on the draw, rather than the bureaucratic approach, which is to say, well, we've now done the 36 page plan. Can we go home? Well, the nice question now from Alejandro Duran, which says, um, why do contemporary Western societies magically think that government can, can do anything, including you know, abolishing harmful respiratory disease? Well, I, I think our desire to believe that we can be fully protected against all contingencies uh, has become a part of the problem. You know, one death is one death too many as a philosophy that I heard articulated at one point by the governor of New York. But I mean, in truth, there will always be death. It's not as if uh, there was no death and then COVID came along. Even last year, COVID was the third cause of death in the US after cancer and heart disease. And the idea that we can somehow eliminate uh, excess mortality for, for, for the foreseeable future is, is a, a delusional one. And so is the idea that it's the government's responsibility. In reality, when I talk about disaster preparedness and rapidity of response, it's as much about what uh, you do as a, a citizen, member of a family, member of a community, uh, employee or employer, because disasters don't just affect us as citizens of states, they affect us in all those other domains. If I think about the case of the earthquake in California, which at some point I suspect I shall have to confront because we're, we're kind of due one, there's going to be a big one at some point, who knows when. Uh, I worry that uh, at the neighborhood level and the family level, we haven't really thought through what we'll do and I haven't really drilled in the move, way that move back, move back to the UK Neil. That's the, that's well that's the, that's the simplest solution and then all you have to worry about is occasional flooding uh, but which by the standards of the rest of the world just looks like a few puddles uh, but but I, I I do think that it's it's about thinking the right way not only in the expectation that the bureaucrats will do it for you but but actually in in one's capacity as a, say an em employer because the disaster doesn't care really about your your status and very few organizations it seems to me drill for the kind of contingencies that could be really uh existence threatening in the way the military do and i think the interesting thing here is that because disasters happen in military life so often and so with such high a cost, military culture is rather better at this than civilian culture. Uh, it, and it's drummed into people in the military at, at Sandhurst and elsewhere that no, no plan survives contact with the enemy, that you're going to have to make decisions at a in a relatively decentralized way in the battlefield. In truth, this is true of disasters of all kinds, not just in war. And that's part of the theme of the book. Um, you know, we, we have to let you go because um, I know you, you've got something on at two and so do we. Um, but um, just one very quick final question, um, which, which I did like. Um, what is the role of the historian today and is it endangered? And who is your favourite current modern historian? <laughs> uh, this is a, a great question and I know that time is short, so I'll keep it short. History is in grave danger. Academic history departments in the United States seem intent on the destruction of the subject by essentially reversing uh, the, the role of the historian 
instead of trying to understand the past in its own terms, we now are sent on a mission to condescend to the past by pointing out its terrible lapses from the uh, the values of uh, of early 21st century London or or Portland, Oregon. There's a major crisis in academic history. It's, it's increasingly difficult to see any of the kind of history that I believe in being done in major departments. And I'm afraid there's some truth uh, in that statement with respect to, to the UK. Uh, that means that history is increasingly done outside history departments. Uh, the applied history organization that I'm involved with operates at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Hoover Institution and in a bun bunch of as associated and affiliated groups, very few of those involved are really now much in, engaged in what history departments do. I'll, I'll shout out Peter Frankopan, uh, uh, an Oxford historian uh, whose uh, Silk Roads book uh, many of you will have, have come across as somebody who really is uh, a role model uh, because he has such tremendous uh, erudition range both geographical and linguistic and chronological and he also wrote a piece that was published in prospect in december of 2019 saying that the thing we really had to be ready for was a pandemic it was easy enough to talk about pandemics uh, in all the previous years but to publish the piece predicting a pandemic the month it was beginning that takes uh, the kind of skill that i i think makes a true applied historian so i i'm, I'm happy to give uh, a shout out to him and he's also irritatingly handsome and irritatingly good at cricket. So damn it, <laughs> and younger than me, it's not fair. Didn't be allowed. Um, thank you so much, Neil. Thank you all for, for watching. Um, please, if you enjoyed this and want to see more like it, uh, then subscribe to the Capex newsletter. Uh, follow us on Twitter. And thank you all very much for your time. And uh, hopefully, see you again very soon, Neil. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks, Robert.